This is a production of Cornell University. Um, I want to start off with a familiar slide for everybody, and that's the world population growth from 1700 to 2100. It's projections and its growth rate. And the main, this, this population has and will continue to place stress on agriculture. And the main point of this slide is that to feed this population increase, we're gonna to need to make agriculture more productive, but also more sustainable. And as a, as a major aspect of sustainability, we need to keep in mind that humans already control the majority of nitrogen and phosphorus flows in the world. And so any, any solution to sustainability, which is going to feed right back into productivity, those, those, two, uh, those two goals are not uh, exclusive, are going to have to, any solution to sustainability is going to have to focus and to address nutrient management and reuse. And so how then can we use genetics to work towards this? And really, going into us, we, we think we can use genetics to change nutrient flow. And so we can move from go, focusing specifically back on the maize, we can use genetics to, to change nutrient flow. And so we can go from this conventional system where we're taking our nitrogen and phosphorus, we're fixing it from the air or mining it from the lithosphere, we're throwing it onto, the, onto our agricultural fields. It's absorbed by the plant, some of it's lost, it's used for photosynthesis, photosynthesis, and then at the end of the season, it's most of this nitrogen and phosphorus is loaded into the kernels. We come through with our combines, we harvest it, and then the nitrogen, in the form of protein and the phosphorus, and the starch and the grain are all forwarded onto an end use. If we can, if we look at this, can we? We can use genetics to change this nutrient flow and fundamentally change what we're pulling off the field. And as part of that, we need to view. We need to view our agricultural production fields in a lot of cases, especially for industrial ag, as a place to farm carbon. Um, and those nutrients as something that we need to return to the soil each year and not really the goal of production. And so can we then envision a system that looks like this, where at the end of the season, instead of the nitrogen and phosphorus being loaded into the kernels, we're harvesting the starch alone, the nitrogen and phosphorus is trapped within the cob. We then take that nitrogen and phosphorus, we store it or process it, we reapply it, and then that becomes the primary fertilizer source for the next year's crop. Now, no system is going to be 100% efficient. And so there would need to be, um, for sure, there would be supplemental fertilizer that comes in each year. But if we could recycle 40 or 50%, of the nitrogen and phosphorus that, uh, that are needed to keep the maize field productive, that would be a huge decrease in the amount that we need to fix from the atmosphere or mine from the lith lithosphere and um, hopefully make maize production more sustainable and uh, a contributor, uh, a, uh, a helper towards mitigating climate change instead of something that contributes to it. And so when we're reimagining this and using genetics to change this nutrient flow, there's two aspects that need to be addressed. The first would be the end uses. Can we get away with leaving the nitrogen and phosphorus out of the maize end uses? And then the second would be, can we use genetics to actually do this? Is the physiology in the genetics? Can we, can we make this happen and store nutrients within the cob during kernel loading? And so I want to talk about the end uses first. And if we look at maize end uses, if we take the 2019 maize harvest, which is about 340 million metric tons of maize, 40% of that goes into ethanol production and 40% goes directly into animal feed. Out of ethanol production, the starch is, used, is converted to sugar and then into ethanol. Any component that's not starch comes out and is, is, uh, is called stiller's grains or solubles. And those distillers grains are mostly used for animal feed. And so we end up with 80% of the phosphorus and 80% of the protein in maize grain being used 
in animal feed. So that ends up being about a million metric tons of phosphorus and about 30 million metric tons of protein. And so we need to address whether in livestock feed we can eliminate these two components. I would argue that for phosphorus, we can already, for sure we can, we can decrease or even eliminate it in the maize kernel with minimal effect on, on in animal feeds. And the reason that it, there's two reasons for that. One is that maize primarily stores phosphorus as phytic acid, which is not digestible in monoruminant animals. This can be somewhat mitigated by the addition of phytase, either by modifying, um, modifying genetically modifying these animals to endogen endogenously produce phytase or by adding it to their feed ration. But that doesn't address the second issue, which is purely the amount of phosphorus that these animals are being fed. It's too much for them to use effectively and absorb effectively. And so we end up with a large pool of excreted phosphorus. Um, and there's difficulty concentrating that enough to make uh, movement of it to, to, uh, to um, it's difficult to concentrate that excreted phosphorus into a form that's economically viable to move the distances that's needed. Um, maize nitrogen, so maize protein, is, is more unclear. The end use of this definitely needs to be investigated more. So the digestibility and end use is higher than in phosphorus. This case. And protein is also used as metabolizable energy by these animals. But that has to be balanced with the fact that half of the maize nitrogen is being funneled through ethanol production and the drying of distillers grains represents a large energy sink in an ethanol plant. And so this, onto the next point here, projections on the future of animal production. So y'all have probably all heard Ed's talk about where we're gonna get protein in the future. And if that happens, that's gonna to serve to decrease the value of maize protein and freeing up, freeing up uh, nitrogen for recycling on field. Um, so one of the things that I would like to do this year and that I will be doing this year is some engineering modeling and economic modeling to help us answer this question of where, of whether nitrogen and when nitrogen will become available for reuse. So moving on to physiology, physiology and the genetics real quick. I just wanna point out that maize is really well positioned to allow for two product streams, kernels and cobs. They're of manageable size and mass. Um, and I also wanna point out that the maize cob is mostly vascular and structural tissue. And this storage of nutrients in vascular and structural tissues is not new. And so the physiology of storing nitrogen and phosphorus within the maize cob is not something that's incredibly outlandish. This is, these are bark storage proteins in populace. And so in the winter, we can see that there's a lot of protein storage vacuoles. And then in the summer, those all disappear because they've been remote. All that protein has been remobilized to the leaves for photosynthesis. And then focusing even uh, with an even with an even uh, even closer closer up image of these protein storage vacuoles, we see that phosphorus is stored in a very similar manner in these perennial species as it is in the maize kernel. And so this this begs the question of are protein storage and phosphorus storage really evolutionarily conserved, and is it just the location? So in annuals, it would be dumped, nitrogen and phosphorus would be deposited in seeds, whereas in perennials, it's stored in perennating tissues so that it can be used year after year. And so that begs the question, is it evolutionary, evolutionarily conserved and can we use that to, uh, to develop a, a, maize, a maize plant that stores nutrients in the cob at the end of the season? And so with that in mind, the question then becomes, can we turn maize cobs into nutrient sieves such that at the end of the season, that's intercepting and storing nitrogen phosphorus in the cob and preventing its loading into the kernels. And so as a concept, it seems like this idea would work. Um, so further, further, uh, 
further research and, and experiments would need to be performed on this. So that's what we're hoping to look into in the coming year. And so this also begs the question, does maize store any nutrients in the cob currently at the end of the season? And the short answer to that is, is no, maize does not have any natural variation for cob nitrogen at the end of the season. And we would expect the same to be true for phosphorus. And that's simply because it's an annual plant. There's no benefit to it for maize to store any nutrients because it won't be able to access those easily in the next year. Um, it benefits it to shunt all the nutrients that it can into the kernel. And so the accumulation of nitrogen and phosphorus in the cob is going to represent a challenge to genetic modification. Um, it's going to require a lot of research to implement. So appropriate modifications must be identified and perennials can perhaps serve as a source of inspiration in genetics. And so as we've seen with the popular species, there is lots of, uh, there, there is um, storage of nutrients in vascular system that we perhaps can leverage for, um, for the, for the, for the development of a system like this. And so, but perennials, but more closely related species may be better, better sources. And so one of the things that we're hoping to, to do is we have trypsicum available in the Cornell fields. We're gonna see what nitrogen storage proteins does trypsicum use um, within its rhizomes to store nitrogen in successive years. And so we'll do proteomic analysis in the, in the summer and the winter and look for changes in relative abundance. Um, and maybe we'll segment, segment it out and see if we can't find where it's storing, where it's storing its nitrogen. And as part of that, we can use these, the sequences of these proteins to perhaps identify homologs in maize that could be co-opted or um, use those actual proteins as sources for modification. So with that, coming up on time, I wanna acknowledge USDA and the Buckler Lab, and I would love to have your questions here. Awesome, thank you for that great talk, Travis. Um, if anybody has a, a question or two, we have maybe a minute. So from Mike Gore, could turning the cobs into a nutrient sieve work through alternating, alternating, al altering tissue specific regulation of native maize genes or would it require a transgenic gene insertion approach? So I, I do not know. I would imagine that something that, I would imagine that it might be possible by alternating tissue specific regulation of native maize genes, but it might be easier to do using a transgenic approach, but I do not know. Um, one of the experiments that we would love to do if we, uh, if we can partner with some, with, uh, with uh, any of these plant breeding companies would be to express opaque 2 in the cob and see what happens. So from Kevin, how many sessions of trypsicum do you intend to look at and assess natural variation for in storage and rhizomes? We have... We're looking at it in about 10 sessions. Uh, and that's a pretty wide range. We've got Floridonum and uh, the Dactyloides uh, and some of their crosses as well. Any, uh, any, more, any more questions, feedback? And if we don't have time to ask a question or to formulate, formulate a question, please send me an email. I'd love to have feedback, pushback on this idea. Um, so, Tra Travis, just real yeah. quick, uh, assuming you, you have all this P and N in the cob, do you just leave the cobs in the field or you have to harvest them and take them somewhere or what do you so do? So that would be a, that would be another aspect that would need to be, need to be examined. So there's, when you grow soybeans or when one grows soybeans, the next year, there's typically a yield bump in maize. And the thought behind that is that the, uh, the nitrogen in the root nodules from the previous soybean crop contributes to the available nitrogen for the maize plant and uh, increases the soil health for that crop. And so, well, root nodules are pretty lignified tissue, just like a maize cob. There's differences for sure. Um, 
but it might be that if we deposit the nutrients within the cob, the cob is a lignified tissue that would degrade slowly and provide sort of a slow release fertilizer for the maize crop. But that would require more research um, and simply testing that out. And it may be the case that the cobs need to be harvested and stored, stored over winter and then chemically processed in some manner to make that, uh, make the NMP available. Hopefully that answers your question there. Awesome. Thank you again for that, that great talk, Travis, and the great discussion. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.